I'm actually in Paris. I fly to Paris tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. And I'm coming back next week. You go for the Women's Forum? Or yeah, I'm going for uh, FIA. We yeah. are going to be Mars. It's not turned on right, right, right now. now. But if yeah, yeah, but I, I, ask my, uh, I will ask my office to organize something with you. Super. Okay. Uh, Christophe, je, 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 me, je, 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 Sehr geehrte äh, Frau Ministerin Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, sehr geehrter äh, Minister Maas, Madame Secretary General, dear Elgar, dear Nadia Murad, Prince Zaid, Kenneth Roth, David Bisley, dear colleagues and friends, lieber Christoph, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here and to de deliver these welcome remarks at this event, which allows to assess Germany's role at the UN, and at the same time to bid farewell to its permanent representative, Christoph Huysgen. And these two have been inextricably, inextricably linked during the past years. Lieber Christoph, you embodied Germany here at the United Nations in New York at the height of your career. I won't come back on it. Everybody knows your impressive courses from the Foreign Service to the post of Director of the Policy Unit of Javier Solana at the European Union and to the 12 years served as advisor to the Federal Chancellor Angela Merkel. To me, the most remarkable line may be your postdoctoral research at Sorbonne University in Paris, indeed. <laughs> as I have to be short, I will focus on your years here in New York and in particular on your term in the Security Council that I witnessed closely. During this term, Germany, under your leadership, Christoph, achieved three important things. First of all, Germany at the Security Council had thought to take the lead in crisis prevention and resolution. And, that I, and as assumed it from the outset, it, and I should say you, had the courage to take the lead on a number of thematic priorities, climate, women, human rights, and humanitarian issues despite a difficult context within the Council and significant pressure. It came with success, notably on Libya and the Sudan. This leadership has helped pushing things forward. For example, on Libya, Germany has capitalized on its role as COPEN, leading to the organization of the Berlin Conference in early 2020 with the direct involvement of the Chancellor. The structures the exchanges between international actors following on from previous initiatives. The conclusion of the conference were endorsed by the Security Council in a resolution that we help to make operational and which remains a guideline in dealing with the issue. Second, you, Christoph, and Germany have contributed to the affirmation of a strong European voice in the Security Council. Germany's presence in the Council which went hand in hand with a particularly large European caucus council, counting up to five member states in 2019, was part of a dynamic to strengthen the European voice therein. In terms of substance, it has contributed to a strong European voice on the Israeli-Palestinian issue and on all European issues, including the Western Balkan. Of course, in this dynamic, the French-German tandem at the particular place, the jumelage of our two presidencies has been, I think, the most visible part of it, allowing to push common priorities and acting together for the better work of the Council. But it goes beyond that. On every topic, 
we have been particularly close and tried to combine our strength and our relays for the best solution and the better efficiency of the council. It is also entrusted in our common belief in the multilateral method, which we concretely promoted here at the UN and through the Alliance for Multilateralism created at the initiative of our two foreign ministers. And thirdly, in a very difficult context marked by obstruction and polarization, Germany has nevertheless carefully invested its role as a member of the Council, and it was important in this regard to show that Germany has the legitimacy and the capacity to act as a permanent member. Germany came well prepared with strong expertise on many issues, combined with political will and professional communication skills. Germany can rightly claim several successes with its 2019-2020 term on the Security Council. It was important to show that the G4 demands are not just a statement of claim, but a legitimate commitment. These three things, leadership in crisis prevention, European affirmation, and responsible action defines the most, in my opinion, Germany and Christoph Huysgen at the United Nations. Indeed, this success owes much to your leadership, Christoph. You have been able to put forward a style and communication marked by the search of symbols. This led to noteworthy initiatives, such as the opening of the curtains in the council chamber in the name of transparency or the presence of an hourglass on the table in the name of efficiency. In every intervention, you had favor interactivity and direct exchanges for greater efficiency and real action. This is what the Security Council lacks when it's bogged down in posturing and declaratory, declaratory justing. I know that your style and efforts have been appreciated beyond the Council. It has contributed to what has made Germany great at the UN in recent years. Lieber Christoph, ich wollte mit einem einfachen Wort schließen. Danke. Ich danke dir für deine Freundschaft, dein Engagement und deine Aufrichtigkeit. Danke für das, dass du für die deutsche französische Zusammenarbeit im Sicherheitsrat getan hast. Ich werde dir sehr stark vermissen und ich denke, das wird auch jeder hier. I know it's my pleasure to introduce the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, who is intervening through a video message from Paris, I think. <laughs> Dear friends, Christoph Eusgen is an outstanding diplomat. Dear friends, Christoph Eusgen is an outstanding diplomat, a skilled analyst of international affairs, and not least, a good colleague and friend. His presence here in New York for the past four years has greatly enriched our work, notably during Germany's membership in the Security Council. It is therefore a pleasure to express my profound gratitude for his contributions as he concludes not only his service at the United Nations, but a long and highly accomplished career in the German Foreign Ministry and as National Security Advisor to Chancellor Merkel. Across those years, Ambassador Heusgen has been a strong supporter of the United Nations and of international cooperation. His service in New York coincided with a tumultuous period in the world's affairs that has witnessed horrific conflicts, threats to democracy and human rights, and of course, the all-encompassing COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout, he was the dynamic and determined, capably representing Germany's interests while also pursuing the global good and recognizing that so often in today's world, these are one and the same. Dear Ambassador Eusgen, you leave a legacy of effective principled service. We thank you and wish you well in all your future pursuits.
very warm words to you, Christoph Heuskin. Please let me so before, say before we start some very warm words of welcome to you who took the time to come here even though there is a very important soccer game, we all know that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are very happy to have you here. We are also very happy to have an audience that we cannot see, but who can see us. And we have remote panelists as well. So since Christoph Heusken is leaving us after not only four years at the United Nations, but also 41 years in the Foreign Service, I think this is a great moment to take stock in what was, what is, what should be in the United Nations and how Germany can contribute. So we will do that because um, all of you have been companions and friends. We'll do that with a little help from your friends. And I will start by introducing the panel. To my left, Her Excellency, Germany Minister of Defense, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer. She came all the way from Germany. Uh, no, she has a couple of other things to do here, but <laughs> we're very, very happy to have her here. Thank She's you. our guest of honor. To my right, His Royal Highness, Prince Said Ra El Hussein, who is uh, actually the CEO and President of the International Peace Institute. And as such, he has cared and does care for the core value of the United Nations human rights. Thanks for being here. Invisible right now, until we hopefully will see them very soon, is um, uh, one of our panelists, Helga Schmidt, OC Secretary General, which she will talk to us a little later. I um, suppose she will be visible very soon. Um, she is, as you all know, has been the uh, Iran negotiator, the negotiator of the Iran deal. She is now the Secretary General of OSCE. And um, I think most people think she is the more, um, she has the biggest perseverance of all women ever <laughs> who have been in negotiations. So welcome, Helga Schmidt. And we also have Nadia Murad, she is in Paris right now. You all know she is the Nobel Peace Prize winner from 2018. Also, she is um, in, uh, the chairwoman of Nadia's initiative. She has survived a genocide. She is a courageous and amazing and incredibly, incredibly resilient person. Hi, Nadia Murad. Very nice that you can join us. Thank you very much for that. There's also an invisible friend, <laughs> and that is um, somebody we talked to a little later. He's probably watching the soccer game. That is uh, German Minister of Foreign Affairs, Heiko Maas, who will talk to us a little later. And of course, Christoph Heusken himself, the ambassador for another day, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> and the to rest say. of today. <laughs> and the rest of today, yes. And um, to, to make it not too formal, we asked our guests to share a little anecdote, a little moment, something they won't forget about the four years you've been here. So let me start with His Royal Highness, Prince Said. Well, thank you, Christian. I, I'm delighted to be back here and to see so many friends. Um, no sooner had I left my post in Geneva, uh, I'd already heard about uh, Christoph Huygens and um, that there was this noisily principled German ambassador in New York who was stirring things up. And uh, I arrived back in New York and my wife and I were walking around Central Park. And uh, my wife said to me, isn't that the German ambassador? And she pushed me, she said, go and introduce yourself. And I, I was looking at Christoph as he was doing his exercising. And I could see from his, his face it was not a good day in the Security Council. <laughs> it was one of these workouts that you only have when you're deeply frustrated. And I said to my wife, look, I'm going to wait until I have a proper occasion to meet. And we did meet later on. And I only wish we could have served uh, together. Thank you so much. Um, Helga Schmidt, would you like to share a little moment? Um, more than a little moment. I have to say that Christoph and I have parts of our career in common. We were both directors of the policy unit of Javier Solana, and we both worked in the cabinet of uh, German Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel. But Christoph was always ahead of me. And, uh, and, uh, and I have to say, I consider him really my mentor. Because, and, 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 and why? Because I actually was the first woman at the time to join the cabinet of a German foreign minister. This is 25 years ago, but it was not easy uh, in the early days. Christoph remembers that. 
And I could always rely on his uh, support and his advice and his friendship. So he's not only an outstanding diplomat, he's a very, very uh, human person. And I'm very proud to consider him my friend. Thank you for that. Nadia Murat, did you also have a moment that you can remember? Yes. I first met Ambassador Hoiskin back when he served as an advisor for Chancellor Merkel. But I truly saw his principles in action when I had the privilege to work with him in 2019 on passing UN Security Council Resolution 2467. Working together on this successful legislation has been a highlight of my advocacy work because I know it will benefit survivors and women around the world. I want to extend my warmest congratulations to Ambassador Hoiskin for such an esteemed and impactful career. The German Foreign Office is losing a principal leader and the United Nations will miss your unwavering commitment to a multilateral action. I am heartened though that your tenure has raised the level of moral clarity in the international community. Thank you, Nadia Morad, for these very friendly and warm words. And I will now turn to a person who has known Christoph Hoiskin for a long time, maybe longer than many here. And um, maybe I shouldn't ask you for an anecdote, and I won't. But um, I think uh, we do have a serious reason why we're here. And actually, um, MINUSMA is, uh, as you all know, the Mali mission. And 12 German soldiers have been hurt badly. So in Germany, people are sort of rethinking the idea. Should we really be there? Should we really do that? Should we really find the mission? Annabrie Kramp-Karrenbauer, as a Minister of Defense, uh, what do you have to say to them? So, um, first of all, um, I would like to say that I'm very happy that uh, all of our service members are in a uh, stable condition right now. This is the, the most important thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, there was an, uh, an attack uh, some days ago. And uh, this shows that uh, MINUSMA isn't uh, just a very important mission, it is a very dangerous mission as well. Um, but um, right now we have an ongoing political discussion in Germany. I, I think this is quite normal. Um, but um, I have to say that the UN can rely on Germany when it comes to peacekeeping. And uh, we, we want to continue this engagement even under difficult uh, conditions because I think this uh, mission is needed uh, to provide uh, stability in the region. And so we are committed and uh, we, remain commit we remain committed. Okay, thank you, clear commitment. Um, I will then, without further ado, give the word to you for some remarks, because this is about also the last, uh, the two years in the Security Council and the last four years for, of Christoph Hoiskin, so please. So, thank you, and uh, I have uh, taken some, uh, uh, some remarks, key remarks, so, Excellences, dear representatives of the United Nations, esteemed colleagues, dear Ambassador Hoiskin, it is my great joy to be here today with all of you to celebrate both the United Nations and Ambassador Christoph Heusken. Let me first take a look at the UN and the daunting task that lie ahead of us. The United Nations stand for universal values, especially inalienable human rights. By universalism, but universalism is increasingly under pressure, under pressure from governments for whom human rights, self-determination and international law are a nuisance and an obstacle. We witness how forces inside and outside the UN are eager to undermine weaken and rewrite the rules of dignity and solidarity that humanity has given itself. We witness how unilateral power politics in open disregard for fundamental human concerns is once again gaining ground. 
it is our task to counter this trend and to stand the ground for universalism. Human rights are not just a domestic concern in any given country. Their validity does not stop at any country's border fence. That's why I'm proud to say that Germany has demonstrated its support for the human rights agenda in many different ways and for many years. For example, in 2019, by strongly supporting resolution 2467, which asked for ending sexual violence in war zones, or by the unprecedented joint call led by Germany for China to end human rights abuse in Xinjiang, and also by pushing the Alliance for Multilateralism here inside the UN. But when it comes to human rights, Germany's main focus in recent years has been on the issue of peacekeeping. With our contributions to the Action for Peacekeeping initiative launched by the UN Secretary General as a champion for more women in peacekeeping, as the fourth largest funder of UN peacekeeping missions, with 1,000 troops in the UN's MINUSMA in the Sahel region, with our recently renewed mandate for UNIFIL in the Mediterranean. There is an undiminished demand for UN peacekeepers around the world. For effective peacekeeping, it is absolutely crucial that it is conducted in close compliance with the UN's human rights agenda. As I said in July of last year in the Security Council, human rights have to be a first concern in peace operations. They can never be subsided for operational effectiveness. Ultimately, military success is only possible as long as fundamental rights are firmly defended. How blue helmets conduct their operations has a direct influence on how UN peacekeeping and the United Nations itself is being judged by people in every corner of the world. Peacekeepers function as role models. As a consequence, Germany has pledged to make human rights training mandatory for all peacekeeping operations, and it has offered its help to others. And apart from peacekeeping, Germany has, of course, been active on other important issues as well, from, from climate change and international security to UN reform. I'm very proud to say that Germany is active on all of these issues, but so much more work needs to be done. Let us keep fighting for the good cause. And ladies and gentlemen, I know it is not enough to have an ambitious agenda at the UN. You also have to have the right people in the UN to drive this agenda. And I'm very thankful that we have had a diplomat of Christoph Heusken's caliber to fight for all these causes and to make Germany's voice heard. Since July of 2017, Ambassador Heusken has been Germany's representative to the UN. During this time, he made his mark as a gifted operator who has always had an idea up his sleeve. Let it be the opening of the curtains in the Security Council chamber or bringing the legendary hourglass to Security Council sessions to remind people that time is precious. But now, in just a few days, Ambassador Heusken's time in the German Foreign Service will come to an end. Dear Christopher Heusken, let me express my deep gratitude for your long, outstanding, and very distinguished service for our country over the past 40 years. Thank you for making such a big difference as a diplomat and as a human being. We all hope that we can continue to rely on your excellent advice even after your departure. 
And from the bottom of my heart, I wish you and your wife the very best for the future, joy and happiness. God bless both of you and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Annegret kamp tambor our Foreign Minister. Thank you very much for these warm words. Um, I would just keep going on that topic, human rights. In recent, uh, we had recent very grave human rights violations in Myanmar, the murder of US journalist Khashoggi. We had the detention of a million Uyghurs and um, a very strong call for the United Nations to act. And I want, before we dive into that team, uh, theme, I would like to introduce a couple of more remarks from other friends of Christoph Heuskin. This would be David Millibrand, President of the International Rescue Committee, Kenneth Roth, Executive Director of Human Rights, and David Beasley, Executive Director, World Food Programme. Christoph Huysgen has been a tremendous fighter for some of the world's most vulnerable people in his time at the United Nations, and he leaves a tremendous legacy of German presence at the institution. We don't just need Germany to defend the rules-based international order, we need Germany to be an exemplar of how to advance that order. I think that means four things. First, Germany continuing to ensure that its actions at home are consistent with its efforts internationally. Second, Germany to be an investor in the multilateral system. Thirdly, Germany to be a thought leader when it comes to the advance of the global public goods on which we all depend. And finally, Germany at the United Nations to be a consensus builder, not the lowest common denominator, but the highest common factor, which after all is the basis on which the UN Charter was established. Thank you, Christoph. Long may Germany help advance the rules-based order. I could not have asked for a stronger defender of human rights than Christoph. During Germany's two years on the Security Council, he personalized human rights, repeatedly bringing witnesses and activists into the chamber. He took on Maduro's repression in Venezuela and challenged Russia to allow cross-border humanitarian aid to Syria. Perhaps most important, he pressed China to end its persecution of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. He organized an unprecedented 39 governments to condemn that repression. And he hosted a virtual event joined by 51 countries to spotlight it. Invoking Reagan in Berlin, Christoph called on China to tear down the detention camps. Beijing felt the heat. It took the extraordinary step of trying to disinvite participants. When Germany left the Security Council, one Chinese diplomat said, good riddance. My message to Christoph is good work. Thank you for caring so deeply and for your highly effective partnership. Ambassador, it's good to see you. When I heard you were going to retire, quite frankly, I was brokenhearted. You've been such a great friend and such a great ally, not just to me, but the World Food Program, which means you've been a great friend to all those that are struggling around the world, trying not to die or go to bed from hunger. And so thank you, because you clearly have understood the impact that food insecurity has to the world. And particularly in today's time, when so many people are struggling, you have helped lead the way, not just in the General Assembly, but also in the Security Council, so that Germany has become one of the greatest supporters of helping the poor and the needy around the world. And so thank you for that leadership. I can't tell you, honestly, from the deepest part of my heart, how much I appreciate all that you have done. And I know even though you're retiring, you're, you're not going to finish. you got more you're going to do. Your voice will forever have an impact. And I know you're going to continue to do things to make the world a better place. So on behalf of the World Food Program and me personally, Christoph, thank you. I really appreciate your friendship and all you've done. Making the 
world a better place. That is a sentence that probably resonates very well with all of you who are here. Everyone wants to do that, but does the United Nations fall short of doing that or is she doing a good job? Christoph Heusken, we heard that rallied 39 nations in order to press China to uh, tear down the walls of the detention camps, but nothing happened. China does what China does. And um, there are other examples for that. So, Prince you are a fighter for human rights. Do you think the United Nations could do more? Well, first of all, just listening to everyone speak about Christoph, um, it, it reminds me of a, a feeling we had in Geneva that, that silence brings you no respect. Um, but outspokenness also is surprisingly easy. Uh, what I admire Christoph Huygens for deeply, and it's the most difficult thing to achieve, it's, it's not the outspokenness, it's the moral consistency. And for all of us who represented or represent governments, the way that politics works, the way that we interact with other states, achieving that moral consistency is extremely difficult. And only individuals with enormous talent and strength and determination can approach that. And I think this, for any young diplomat, a model permanent representative would be Christoph Huygens. I'd hope that you lecture widely to many diplomatic academies around the world. Um, yes, I, I, most of the conflicts that we see, almost all the conflicts we see, the origins are a human rights deficit that has become septic. If we don't stop it at that point, it becomes very difficult, as we saw in the case of Syria, to stop it later on. Um, and so the earlier we perceive it, the more we can try and do something about it. But it requires a little bit of a readjustment, and I'll, this, I'll end with this point. I think the balance between the Secretariat and the Member States is a bit lost. The Secretariat is the principal organ of the UN. It's not a service provider. And the more that member states understand that, the more that you can have a relationship that produces a good result. But for that to work, you need uh, outstanding ambassadors, and Christoph Huygens is one. And there are many here, actually, who fit that role as well. And uh, I think all of us would uh, look at Christoph as still being a model for, for most ambassadors, and we're all sorry to see him go. Syria comes to mind when Christoph Hoskin tried to actually negotiate um, border crossings for humanitarian help. This was vetoed over and over by Russia. We, we have these situations in the Security Council over and over again where the veto powers cancel each other out and make it un impossible to move forward. Is that something we can have in the future or do we have to reform the Security Council? Well, I mean, clearly the, the, the problem is always going to remain with us unless there's an alternative. If the veto is being exercised under the relevant article of the Charter, there has to or ought to be an alternative to the suggested course of action, a plausible alternative by the permanent member exercising it. If there isn't, then it's just a club beating uh, to death a collective, a potential collective response. And the consequence is that people suffer grievously um, in context of war or in the context of severe deprivation of human rights. Thank you. One of the more successful resolutions was probably a resolution 2467, if I have it right, um, about women, and this is where Nadia Murad comes into it, women who are um, have to be protected in violent conflicts because they are exposed to violence, to all kinds of sexual harassment and worse. So um, Nadia Murat, who I at this point don't see but hope can hear me, let me ask that. Yes, I hear you. You're there. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Nadia, um, how important was the United Nations, how important was Christoph Heuskin for you? You mentioned that in the beginning already, but is that resolution, is that really a step forward or do we need much more? As a survivor and advocate, building political will for passing and implementing legislation to address sexual violence in conflict is an uphill battle. This is why I was so proud 
to work with Germany on UN Security Council Resolution 2467. This resolution expanded the, the UN's commitments to ending sexual violence in conflict and introduced a survivor-centric lens to international law, peacekeeping, and security. The resolution was made possible by Ambassador Hoiskin's diplomatic courage and the German presidency's bold agenda for the Security Council. The landmark legislation, as well as the collaborative measures necessary to pass it, is reflective of a man and a country willing to step up in the name of human rights. A nation that speaks up and follows through with action and support for survivors. I believe it is this rare combination that makes Germany an effective leader on the world stage. The German mission garnered support for UN Security Council Resolution 2467, while also resettling Yazidi survivors in Germany to support their recovery. Germany advocates to improve international standards on justice and accountability. And it has begun prosecuting ISIS perpetrators for genocide and sexual violence in its own courts. Germany leads by example, and this is key for meaningful multilateralism. We build trust as a global community, not only with our words, but with our willingness to extend a hand and support each other through action. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nadia. If I remember that correctly, when um, the resolution was introduced, China and Russia abstained, which is very sad. What do you have to say to that? How, what is the explanation to that? And what can the United Nations or Germany, for that matter, do to convince other nations to fall in line? I think we should not give up on, on on that, if a country or a, anyone is just not agreed with what is going to benefit survivors and women all over the world, we should not just forget about it. We should do and finish what we start to make sure that women all over the world will be protected and the, those who committed crimes of, of genocide and sexual violence will be will be held accountable in, in, by the support of, of United Nations and Germany and, and others. So we are still working with everyone, pushing them and not giving up. So we still need uh, Krista and we will not just forget about that resolution because it was a huge step for, for Germany, uh, United Nations and for all of us as, a, as survivors and women. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you so much. I want to briefly ask uh, Christoph Hoiskin how that actually was when you introduced that. I mean, how difficult was it to, to convince countries to actually look after the destiny of women, which has not been explicitly done in that way before? Well, <clears throat> I think the to introduce the topic was was not that difficult because um, after all it is very apparent what happens there are um, and unfortunately this continues to be an instrument of warfare you have in so many um, conflicts you have sexual violence used as an instrument in, and to um, to bring it to the council was not um, that difficult because people were supportive but then the decisive step, of course, was not only then to have a debate, but then to introduce a resolution. Um, the resolution of the Security Council are legally binding um, to get everybody on board. And um, Nadia was very kind of, of highlighting what this new introduction brought, and that is that the 
um, victims, the victims all over the world can point to this resolution and their government and say, you know, we are protected and you have to prosecute. No. So, um, education is very important. Okay. Is it there is accountability. Um, there was one, and, and you know, we have to be honest, there was one um, deficit in this resolution. This was um, adopted during um, the time of um, the Trump administration and we wanted to have a strong sentence in the resolution about sexual and reproductive health that women and, and Nadia knows what I mentioned when young Yazidi women, 12, 13, 14 year olds were, um, were raped, became pregnant and we wanted to actually have this phrase very clearly in the resolution that they have the right for um, abortion and um, um, unfortunately, the U.S. at the time didn't allow this to be expressly said. But the good thing was that um, the U.S. administration um, didn't do their homework. So what we were at least able to do is in a, a uh, the PP in the in the paragraph that we introduce it, we refer to a resolution which clearly allowed for this. So in the resolution 2467, we haven't expressly mentioned it, that it's a deficit, but it is still in the resolution because this right is um, is there and it is referred to. But we would have liked because, um, as I said, when you when you talk about and, and um, we don't have the time, but Nadia can explain this how difficult it is for um, Yazidi women um, who have um, who have been raped by by ISIS fighters then to be accepted back into their community. So this is something which is which is very important and not only for this conflict but also for others. Thank you very much for that little insight. So I promised you the Federal Minister of uh, Foreign Policy in Germany, Heiko Maas, who is now available, I think. <laughs> Hello, Heiko Maas is in Bari at the G20 meeting. Good evening. And um, on a little lighter note here, um, do we know the results of the soccer game? <laughs> Don't mention football, please. Can you hear me? I yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me too? Yes, I hear you. Wonderful. Yeah, as if you were okay. right next door. So what is the result of the German soccer game and what will that mean for the German-British relationship? I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about our ambassador, Mr. Poiske. Lieber, All right. Lieber Herr Botschafter, lieber Herr Botschafter. Christian Ambassador's Excellencies, dear friends, as diplomats, I think many of you are probably used to bidding farewell to close colleagues and friends. And in a way, it is a part of your job description. So maybe it speaks for the fact that I'm a politician and not a diplomat when I tell you today that I will never get used to these goodbyes. So, lieber Herr Hoske, dear Christoph. It is with a heavy heart that we see you go. But I'm glad to be able to accompany you your final steps as Germany's ambassador to the United Nations, even if only virtually, from the G20 foreign minister meetings here in the wonderful Bari. So I will never forget the great conversations we had during my many visits to New York. I hope you too. We celebrated our election to the Security Council together. We fought side by side for humanitarian access to Syria, for women in conflict situations, for human rights and accountability across the globe. You made the European Union visible in the Council. I'm sure many of you will remember the stakeout of the European ambassadors after the meetings. You stood up to pressure even when it came from unexpected corners, because you knew that you, were, that you were fighting for the right cause, for the cause of the people, whether they be survivor of sexual violence from Congo, prisoner in Shenyang, or a torture victim in one of Assad prisoners, prisoners. This might have angered a few, but it has inspired many. And it has lent your voice, Germany's voice, the quality 
that is most important in the international diplomacy, credibility, reliability, and trust. So thank you, Ambassador Hoeskin, for your outstanding service. We wish you all the best for the future. I'm confident that our path will cross again soon. So ladies and gentlemen, on the topic of this meeting, let me assure you that Germany remain, remains a strong supporter of the international order and the United Nations in particular. Together with many of you, we have launched the Alliance for Multilateralism because we believe that multilateral solutions are fairer and more sustainable. To underline this, the German government had re has recently presented its first white paper on multilateralism. It shows how the multilateral order delivers benefits to the people, ranging from clearing, cleaning air to vaccines to the pandemic. And it defines, ladies and gentlemen, areas where we need to improve the existing international order. These discussions must take place within the United Nations, together with all of its member states, and in particular with those who are most affected by climate change, poverty, and conflict. So together we need to work towards a global partnership that benefits everyone. Germany stands ready to do so as we are running again for the Security Council for the 2027-2028 term. And we hope for your support and partnership. So once again, Many thanks to you, Ambassador Heusken. The very best to all of you from here, from the beautiful Bari. Thank you. Thank you, Heiko Maas in Bari, and uh, good luck with whatever you want to achieve. I uh, hope it works out well. Thank you very much. The German voice was sometimes not very loud and clear, <laughs> I have to say. Um, a little broken, but that was only the connection. I hope. Um, the German noise will be loud and clear in the future because there is no lack of conflicts and there is the necessity for crisis management. Often progress is only achieved by one person who is relentless and insistent and has a lot of commitment. Berlin, for example, is proud um, of the Libya conference, the so-called Berlin conference, and I want to introduce to you a woman who has been has taken a big part of that? It's Stephanie Williams who will now send her greetings to Christopher Hoiske. My name is uh, Stephanie Williams, and I was the uh, acting special representative of the Secretary General for the UN Support Mission in Libya until February of this year. I would like to extend my warmest greetings to Ambassador Huskin uh, and congratulations on his uh, momentous 40 years in diplomatic service and to wish him all the best. Uh, in my tenure in the United Nations, Germany played an absolutely critical role on uh, the Security Council as well as on the Sanctions Committee, which they, uh, they headed the Sanctions Committee for Libya. During our tenure, uh, Germany was also the host for uh, the Berlin process, uh, which culminated in resolution 2510 that was passed in uh, February of 2020. Germany's leadership was critical in uh, bringing the international community together around the need uh, for the parties to the Libyan conflict and their external sponsors to bring an end to the violence and a return to the uh, political process. The Berlin process, uh, you know, in sum, created an international architecture which still knits uh, the international community into the uh, three Libyan, uh, intra-Libyan tracks, the economic, political, and military tracks, which to this day continue because the work, there's still a lot of work to be done. Again, I would like to thank uh, Germany, the German leadership, and Ambassador Huskin for his uh, enormous role in this entire process. There is a glimpse of hope for Libya. We're always looking for hope, and we are always looking for people who can assist in bringing that to life. Um, talking about perseverance, Helga Schmidt, again, will be um, our guest right here, remotely, of course. 
Um, she is the person who negotiated the first Iran deal, the one that is now we renegotiated. And, um, but she is, of course, now in a totally different role. She is the uh, general secretary of the OSCE and has now 57 nations who try to put themselves first, I suppose. So, um, Helga Schmidt, what is it that keeps you awake at night these days? What, which one of the many conflicts you have to deal with? I would say almost all of them. <laughs> we have heard just now about Libya and Syria. And I would just say that um, listening to the uh, uh, testi uh, testimonies now, um, the German commitment to multilateralism, and here, of course, uh, Christoph, who's played an outstanding role, is not just a bunch of fine words in a, in a diplomatic setting. I think it makes a real difference on the ground. And this is why uh, maybe allow me just to say a couple of words on the conflicts that indeed have not been mentioned, as the OEC indeed is the um, biggest uh, regional security organization under chapter eight of the UN Charter. So there is, we work very closely uh, with the UN. We play a significant role in Eastern Ukraine, uh, in the conflict settlement process in, in Moldova, Transnistria, Georgia, um, in relation to Nagorno-Karabakh. And Christoph has been involved in all of these in previous capacities, be it in Brussels, in, in, uh, in, in Berlin, or now at the UN. And I just want to say, and that's probably also something that's very high on my agenda is, uh, and Christoph will remember his involvement in the Normandy format um, from his time in the federal chancellery, where I think his really very active engagement um, and also getting the chancellor to engage uh, so, so strongly has been instrumental in overcoming many of the blockages that uh, unfortunately continue to be set, the negotiations in the trilateral contact group and in the OEC's very practical work on the ground. Um, let me but also say that Germany has been always a strong advocate for uh, equipping our biggest monitoring mission, the special monitoring mission in Ukraine with unarmed aerial vehicles, with sophisticated cameras and other technical assets that are vital. And I'm mentioning that because this is, we could not uh, function uh, uh, without that. So, um, but, but there's another point I would like to outline because apart from the conflicts, I'm absolutely convinced that um, uh, we need more women in, as peace mediators and we need uh, stronger provisions also in peace agreements when it comes to uh, uh, gender. And it was mentioned before, but here also, I think Christoph's work on women, peace and security has been absolutely critical. And, and because he's made sure also that peace constituents, women, I would also add youth, uh, uh, are heard because inclusive pro processes are just so much more uh, sustainable. There's clear empiric uh, empirical uh, evidence for that. So, um, and, and for that, I'm, I'm also personally very uh, grateful to him because I think ultimately the success of our work depends very much on the buy-in of, uh, of our members and our willingness and ability to push for the implementation of the common agenda we have. So, and in this context, um, you need strong political commitment, uh, you need uh, moral convictions, uh, you need passion, but you also need the ability to, to rally support behind um, um, doing the right thing and international cooperation, which I think is so uh, important, probably more important than, uh, than, than ever. Mm. Do you, Helga Schmidt, do you have a personal trade secret? Um, how you bring men, even from Iran, men who are not used to negotiating with women, to actually come to compromises? What is it? You have to, first of all, never give up. Uh, so, uh, and always be well prepared, always come well prepared. And maybe another thing is also, I think, is respect the other side. Uh, every negotiator has their dignity. You may disagree fundamentally with their positions, but accept that they also have their, their positions, they have their, uh, their instructions, respect uh, uh, the other side, and then try to find, find a way forward. And perseverance. I mean, we've, I've been in, the, in, the, uh, in this uh, talks for 12 years. We started, it was very much also a German initiative. 
uh, to start in 2003, and we concluded the deal in 2015. By the way, it's not being renegotiated. I think what's happening now is an effort to, to recommit uh, to a good deal, and uh, and then to based on that find uh, find uh, find a way forward that could also then uh, include other uh, other issues. But um, perseverance and 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 I think respect respect also for the other side. Um, yeah, words of wisdom to the Security Council, I would say, <laughs> because um, the wish to find compromise is apparently that uh, wish that ha is not being granted all the time. So thank you very much, Helga Schmidt. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for your words. And um, yeah, we we'll have another topic, a topic we haven't touched yet. And because we also want to look, we want to see what Christoph Heusken has achieved, yes, but we also want to look in the future. And one of the topics that are really, I think, the most important to topics waiting for all of you here and for all of us is climate change. How do we actually save this world? And before we go into that a little bit deeper, um, I would like to introduce um, Abu Avari, the permanent representative of Niger, unfortunately also virtually, and uh, Karen Lindgren, Executive Director, Security Council Report. The role of Germany in the Security Council and its legacy can't be underestimated. We need to give credit to Germany and to my good friend Christophe for his achievement when Germany was a member of, of the Security Council. Uh, Germany has left uh, us with a legacy in the Council as a like-minded group on the uh, I, IEG that we have had the honor um, to chair together with Germany uh, and Niger and that we what we continue sharing today with with Ireland. I can uh, still remember the initial launch uh, at the German mission where we we we, we shared we we, we 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 started sorry where we started the process and from where and through Christoph uh, steering we had uh, a roadmap that allowed the like-minded advance this agenda within the Security Council. And today I can, uh, I can testify that the link between uh, climate change and security is no longer something uh, impossible to, 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 to discuss within the Council. And at least uh, 12 members of the Security Council became like-minded and I think this is uh, the result of the tremendous work of Germany and the one of my, 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 my good friend, uh, Ambassador Christoph. In my uh, national capacity, I can also say that Niger and Germany work hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, especially in making sure uh, the local perspective of our Sahel region are considered when discussing this issue. That was highlighted by Germany, uh, inviting a briefer from Niger, Colonel Major Magaji, to address the Council during their signature event in, in July. I really thank you for, for making it possible for Niger to, to, to testify the wonderful job made by Germany and uh, and by uh, his very able permanent representative, Christoph. Thank you. Germany was a Security Council member during difficult times. Very tough dynamics among the permanent members created a constrained operating environment for the elected members. To this, Germany brought an ambitious and holistic vision of what belonged on the Council's agenda, saw the connections between human rights peace and security and international development, and didn't hesitate to speak up on the toughest of issues and to hold the pen on topics like Darfur, Libya sanctions, Syria cross-border humanitarian aid, and was always ready to speak up for the role that elected members of the Council can and should take on.
Thank you for that. Yes, let's talk about climate because um, that is a topic the United Nations has touched but has not been very successful yet, but um, things might happen. But um, as far as now we're working, we as human mankind are working at our own extinction, no war needed. Um, there was a climate report that has been leaked last week. It's a, a UN climate report that will be published much later, but has been leaked now. And there's a very um, depressing sentence in it. And it says, and those are the scientists who say that, not the politicians. It says, life on Earth can recover from drastic climate shift by evolving in new species and creating new ecosystems. Humans cannot. So, what can the United Nations and what does the United Nations have to achieve in order to finally make progress on this very important topic? I think we all agree, or most of us agree, that the challenge that we are facing, the challenge, the greatest challenge we are facing is climate change. Of course, we lived through the pandemic, um, and, and that was, um, you know, for each and everyone um, very um, grave, but climate change and you mentioned the new report and and what it says about uh, the future um, this is what we have to we have to look at and um, um, the un is the only only place you can do it because you need everybody you cannot do it outside you need the un um, and the paris agreement after all is the un and and we have the commitments we have the commitments from the paris agreement but um, not only do, do we have to implement them, we have to see if um, taking the report into consideration is what we have, um, what we are working on is enough. And um, countries um, like Germany, other countries also have to, of course, do their homework back home, but also contribute that other countries that are not in, in, in a capacity to deal with the issue can do their homework and their um, we have, and, and Germany has just um, um, enlarged its financial contribution from five to six billion euro for next period to, to help other countries. Um, uh, we have COP26 later this year. There needs to be a very strong signal coming out of this um, COP meeting that um, leaders the world takes the problem seriously. Now, we're discussing um, Security Council and um, what um, we have tried to achieve during the last um, um, two years when we were in the Security Council. We didn't um, start this time. Um, the topic of climate, climate change has been on our agenda already when we were in the Security Council eight years ago. Um, we were, for, for those who know the differences, we were able to adopt a presidential statement at the time, but um, we, we didn't get a, a, a resolution. Um, this year, um, when we, or the, these two years, we again put it on our agenda. Um, first, in general, I think it has been said before, when we, when we look at um, uh, security, um, we don't want the Security Council to limit its action to conflicts where there is war, where there is fighting, where there is um, bloodshedding, but we want to look at conflict prevention. What are the drivers? What are the factors that lead to conflict? And there, um, we put um, as one of the issues, and, and um, they said that very, very well in a statement. When you have human rights violation, this, um, you know, when you look at it, this looks serious. This looks, in, this comes um, there. We have conflicts. We have sexual violence. Violence against women lead to conflict. Um, is an instrument of conflict. But then, and this is what, what we really tried very hard, and I would like to, although he is, um, this was a virtual um, address before, I would like to pay tribute to uh, my colleague and friend, the Ambassador of Niger, who was sitting in the Security Council this year when we were jointly there. We, um, uh, we paired to actually um, bring this initiative to the Council. What is it about? It, it is about that we see that climate change is a driver of conflict and Niger the ambassador is very well placed when we look at the Sahel region when you look at Chad Lake but when you look worldwide um, um, I saw a statistic 75 percent of all conflicts worldwide um, have at least partial climate change as its origins and therefore what we tried to convince members of Security Council to agree to a resolution which focuses the work of the Secretariat, the work of 
um, peace mission of blue helmet missions of the peace missions that we have worldwide um, to have a special representative to have the secretary general regularly report about climate change and potential impact that has on security and we worked very hard together we were a group of 10 like-minded countries um, that drove the the process forward um, unfortunately um, we were not able to adopt a resolution because um, again our um, american partners during the trump administration said well nobody has proven that there is climate change so why do we need a, a resolution this has changed um, the new administration um, has is of a um, different opinion um, and and sees the sees the challenges and actually they're also now taking the lead on it and um, it is time um, and uh, there are members of the security council right now in the audience here i think it's time to go at it again and see to it that we adopt a resolution that has these instruments as a substance that the un system is geared on um, on climate change looks when there are regions where it's going what can we do uh, to mitigate this what can we do early on to 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 prevent um, to prevent um, um, conflict it's part of it um, the climate and security, but also the security cannot ignore the issue. It's, of course, wider. And to come back, the key event for me, I think for all of us this year, is COP26, where the world, the population expects um, responses from us. There's also a connection between uh, climate change and the affected nations and human rights, because, of course, uh, nations like Niger are affected earlier, heavier than some other nations. So I'm, I'll put this question to you. How can the United Nations help here? And is it up to the richer countries to really come forward? Yes, I mean, to, to uh, echo the point made by Christoph, the UN is a reflection of the world. The UN is really the world itself. Um, I think so much, and this is a feeling that I'm not alone, I think, in believing, will hinge upon the G20 meeting in July. Um, the whole issue of the $100 billion transfer to the Global South. Uh, the concern is that if that is not properly addressed, then COP26 is, we will start to worry about COP26. Um, the, uh, the matter raised by Germany in the Security Council is critical. Um, after Article 34 of the UN Charter provides for it. Any threat or any situation that may lead to a threat to international peace and security, you know, could be, may be investigated by the Security Council, which is perfectly, creates per the perfect aperture for a council action in this respect. Uh, the council has tools available under the provisional uh, uh, rules. Uh, seldom does it, has it ever used those tools, and it can use them um, if we're going to somehow offset the effects. I think um, it, we will look back in time and thank Germany and thank uh, uh, Christoph Huyskens and his team for opening up this space for discussion. And uh, there will be many debates uh, focused on this. I, I think some people are concerned about the opposition. The opposition makes us more rigorous. Or let's say the opposition in terms of drawing the connection. Um, I think Christoph is right. Uh, there are many that, uh, uh, conditions which, where you see the effect of climate change. Uh, what we have to be careful of is that there are these sort of exculpatory situations where you have movements of people because of drought and, he and sort of heat events, but no violence. We have to explain those as well. And then if you can do those, we're in a, on a much uh, firmer footing when it comes to drawing the connection. Thank you very much. Since we are bidding farewell to Christoph Hoskin, I would really touch one more thing, because it has been mentioned so often, you opened the curtains when, when you came to the Security Council. So the idea was, of course, to have some more transparency and light. And sadly, the curtains are closed again. What happened? How much, how much time do you have? No. <laughs> how much time do you have? You have no. a lot of time now on your hands. <laughs> no, there is, um, it's right. When um, I like daylight and to sit in the Security Council always have this curtain through and, and you can potentially 
look across the Hudson River, look towards um, Queens, and um, um, I said, why, why, why can't we open it? And there was a certain momentum. We, we did open it, and also we were not the only ones. There were some others also doing it. But you, um, you have, um, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative, but, you know, you can overdo it. There are those who are conservative who said, well, we have always sat in this room with this curtain closed and this is the Security Council, we have to continue to have it closed. Then there were, and I have some journalists there, they were said, well, with the cameras, you know, the, the light, confronting you, you cannot get the speakers to, 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 to well. Um, no, I, I hope um, uh, here I, I look at my friend Nicola, who is a permanent member of Security Council. <laughs> um, yes, so um, maybe um, as one of the outcomes of our podium tonight, we will uh, to this afternoon, we'll have um, a new initiative and get light into it. And again, it was, of course, about transparency. This is what um, was mentioned earlier. We, we, want, um, we want light, we want openness. Um, we brought a record number of so-called briefers from civil society to the Security Council so that, it can, that the um, ambassadors are informed by civil, what is actually happening on the ground. And we were very proud. Um, you know, I, was, I had my first um, in the 90s when I worked with, with Helga Schmidt and she mentioned how difficult it was in a, you know, the German Foreign Service when I entered in 1980. We were 50 diplomats and three women. Today this is totally changed, but you know, to get more women and we had a record number of women briefers also coming in the Security Council and I hope this will, this will continue. Yeah, the open curtains would be a stunning legacy, I think, if it happens. And the other thing, of course, that hasn't been mentioned was the hourglass. Yes. Which has been, I think, um, a nuisance for some people because they had to cut this, or could have cut their speeches short, I should say. So, where is it? Are you taking it with you? Well, that was, that was um, one of the ideas, but I leave it um, here in the building, in, um, in the library, um, you know, and, and as, a, as, a, um, as a reminder. No, at the, at the time um, we thought, and um, my colleagues, also my um, colleague from Dominican Republic, Jose, knows who I mean, there were colleagues uh, who are not here today who spoke very lengthy in the Security Council. So, and and um, I, we brought this hourglass in there and turned it around. But then something happened, which um, um, I think I'll tell for the first time publicly, was that we had a colleague, and he's hiding there, um, Mansour from Kuwait, who came up one day and said, Christoph, you said five minutes. I counted it. It was four minutes 30 only. What happened? <laughs> The sand in the, um, the the dry air in the in the security council made the sand run through too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so and Mansour, who Mansour from Kuwait, he found this out. But fortunately, he didn't make it known everywhere because I I know what my Chinese and Russian colleague would have said then. You know, but you know, I was I was not necessarily always their favorite. So. Um, we then, you know, had it disappear, and then actually it was from Thuringia in Germany, and it was handmade, and we later on got a new one which worked, but then our presidency was over, and <laughs> we couldn't it use it, late. and there was nobody who was asking, can we also use it? But it was, again, um, you know, um, what why transparency is hourglass this is this may be gadgets but you know we wanted to get the attention we wanted to have lively debates you know go back and forth and and you know Jose, we we i think to a certain degree we succeeded in this by 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 getting you know a bit more attention to it and get more lively 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 debates the human united nations are as you said reflecting the world but also it's made by people i mean the people here people who talk to each other, who see each other. So I have one last question for you. I would really like to know how difficult it is to have friendships, friendships with people who are of a completely different opinion. Because in a world where everybody is fighting so hard for their positions and sometimes losing their civility, is this a place where that can be saved? I think this is one of the secrets of diplomacy you know you you have to stand up for your position you have to be principled you get respect but at the same time um you know and 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 helga schmidt um talked about this you know 
negotiating for 12 years um, the JCPOA, the Iran deal. It would not have been possible if, if Helga wouldn't have had you know, the confidence of the Iranian counterpart, the confidence of the Chinese, the Russians, uh, the Europeans, of course, that was easy. But, um, you know, so the same thing here, you know, if you want to achieve something, if you want in the end, then um, you ha have also to try to have a personal relationship and, and, you know, to a large degree that was possible. I still remember he couldn't make it, you know, I was um, um, getting at, at Vasilis, my Russian um, colleague, um, you know, at his throat because they were doing terrible things in, um, in, in, in Russia, in, in, in Syria. And um, we had my friend Whitney from the New York Times here who got the Pulitzer Prize about the story um, where Russia actually bombed hospitals in Idlib. So, uh, um, I mean, this was mentioned there. At the same time, you know, the weekend, um, Vasily and I were, were having drinks and, and, you know, it's quite a challenge when you do that with a Russian. But uh, you have this personal relationship. You have this personal relationship that allows you then also when it comes to, to, to it. But I think you have to be clear, principle, but at the same time, see, and this is what, what I think you need to do to be able, as a, this is what makes out uh, diplomats, I think. Friendships against all odds, basically. Yes. Yes. We have another friend of you here, not personally, unfortunately, but remotely. And he is one person who would really, really like to say a few words to you, and his name is Barack Obama. I'm happy to pay tribute to Christoph Heusken and Germany's role at the United Nations and in the wider world, which he has done so much to promote. During my eight years as president, Christoph was a trusted partner who helped Chancellor Merkel navigate so many hard issues in partnership with my administration. I will always be grateful for his trusted counsel and the bonds we deepened between America and Germany. As he prepares to retire from Germany's foreign service, I know I join Angela and many others in thanking Christoph for his wisdom, his work ethic, and his commitment to democratic values. What an honor. So, what was, I mean, you met him apparently when you were still working for Angela Merkel. So, what, what time of your life was harder, working behind the scenes or working in public? This both is something that um, I don't want to miss, you know, to, to work with um, Chancellor Merkel as somebody um, who I consider one of the, you know, best contemporary politician, somebody who is, um, comes from a scientific base, who looks at all problems, um, as I said, from a scientific um, background, looks at all angles, um, thinks about what, thinks about the long range effects, um, very interested, ready to listen. Um, minister also, Minister Kamkarenbauer is also one of the species who is listen to, ready to listen. Helga Schmidt and I, we were in the cabinet of Klaus Kinkel at the time. We had about, to, to make present, we had about 10 seconds and, and then he would start to tell us that he knew everything. Beautiful, <laughs> wonderful. So, <laughs> Chancellor, um, Chancellor was always listening and, and, thinking and, and looking and having the, the, the strategy, you know, safeguard Europe, see to it that Europe stays together and, and that Germany has its place. So to work in the background, to work for a woman like um, Angela Merkel was, was uh, special. But then um, I liked also then, to, you know, at, at the end of a career to also stay in the, in the front line, to be in the first place. And, and I learned so much from the Chancellor, um, which um, um, I only found out while I was working, and that is the straightforwardness, the sightness to be clear, clear cut and say, um, you know, call a spade a spade. Um, also to, um, to have a friendship at the same time to be very clear. And you know, the, to come back to Barack Obama and the Chancellor, they were disagreeing on, on many issues and during the financial crisis, it was not, was not always, always easy, but they respected each other because they, they respected, they knew everybody was fighting or was thinking very um, 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 for their interests and was uh, thinking very hard to come to a, to a conclusion and, and they got along very well. And we worked, and this is the relationship with Barack Obama, of course, was during the, this was perhaps for me the, the highest or the, the, 
The biggest challenge was Russia's invasion of Ukraine and um, it was mentioned before being then in the Normandy format and um, you know negotiating again and again. I see the ambassador of Ukraine here when we were um, you know in the trying to see how we can stop this aggression, how we can uh, stop the advance of, of Russian troops or and their militias in um, um, in the Balceva, you remember Minsk, the, the Minsk uh, night to negotiate that, and then uh, with the Americans playing an important role in negotiating, seeing that we go together. And this was very, this went very well. We were, on, with regard to the sanctions, with regard to the policy, we worked very closely together. And then also, um, we worked closely. This is something um, that the defense minister knows when um, Barack Obama was in, in Hanover um, for a meeting and the question came up, is Germany ready to participate in the enhanced forward presence? And President Obama directed that directly to Chancellor and myself. And I remember at the time when I talked to the um, to the chief of staff and see, are we ready to put 1,000 soldiers on certain uh, notice um, um, to the Baltic countries, and we did, and until today we are active. That that was also something in direct. Still remember that uh, conversations with um, also with Barack uh, Barack Obama. We do have five minutes, so if one of you, <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, would like to ask a last question or have a remark, this is the moment. And um, yeah, somebody will come to you with a microphone. Oh. Sorry, I took, took you by surprise, I think. Yeah. And don't forget the sand uh, clock, you know, the hourglass. <laughs> and please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a journalist. My name is uh, Toby Burns with NHK Japan. Um, my question is a point that you mentioned earlier. Thank you very much for, for this briefing and, and congratulations on, on your, uh, your tenure. Um, my question is about at the Security Council, construing, you know, this pushback from certain countries that we see to talk about certain topics in the context of security that are not deemed as such by other members of the Council. Do you think that this is a, in the future, we will see more uh, tolerance and leniency towards this kind of rhetoric and this, uh, this way of phrasing issues? Or do you think that this is, uh, a fundamental difference. Thank you very much. I think both. Um, you do have countries um, that uh, look at um, the role of the Security Council concentrated just on, on hard conflicts, um, and others look at, at root causes. Um, um, you know, we are sitting there only for two years, the, the permanent members. Um, um, have the, the longer experience. Um, you have to, um, um, I think you have to find the right balance. Of course, you have to concentrate on the conflict, you have to concentrate on the mandates for um, uh, for peace uh, for peacekeeping, we have the you know the mandate for MINUSMA operation, which is key is on the agenda, and you, you have to concentrate on that work. But I think um, you also have to look at the root causes and see what you can, this is also part of it. Um, um, well, I said that before, the question is, how is the dynamic in the Council? I think that over time we have seen that more and more is going into this direction, but um, we are not there yet. Um, I think we need to have more uh, convincing to do that, um, uh, you know, members on the Security Council are ready to, to take this this look at, but then also I think as elected members, we have to be disciplined and uh, um, we have to say at, as we tried it, you know, we, we didn't put, you know, uh, 10 different topics, but we said from the very beginning, we took two top, we take two topics, climate and security and sexual violence and conflict. So concentrating on this, if you, you know, limit yourself, if you do it, then I think also you get acceptance from, um, from the others. And then you have to build, of course, the, the, the support. Um, there is no guarantee that that this conflict prevention will be, you know, a major part of the Security Council. But you know, together, if we push there, um, if public opinion, if the Security Council is asked also from public opinion to look at these, then I think we'll be will be successful. If no one else has a question, I would uh, ask Olaf Skog to say the last goodbye. Yeah.
Oh, of course, he's the EU ambassador. I am to the, the EU ambassador. United Hello. Nations, in case somebody uh, didn't know that. Madam Minister, thank you very much. Um, look, um, uh, maybe it's not surprising, given uh, Christophe's uh, great uh, contribution and popularity, that this event turned uh, almost uh, North Korean in its uh, tribute to the great uh, <laughs> <laughs> leader. But actually, the topic was about Germany. So before I join the tribute to Christophe, let me just say one word or two about uh, Germany's uh, uh, contribution to the UN. And I think it's very important to remember that Germany is a major global power. Uh, in virtue of its economic uh, power, but also its huge political strength. But what makes Germany, I think, stands out compared to some other major powers, it's its strong investment in a multilateral system, probably based on its uh, experience on the European continent over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and that is very significant. We've heard from Helga Schmidt, your investment in the OSCE. Everyone here has seen your investment in the UN. And of course, as the representative of the European Union, we pay uh, you know, a lot of tribute to the fact that um, Germany invests so much into the European Union project as well. So an A plus for your commitment to multilateralism. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> A second, a second reflection on uh, German attitudes. Um, Sweden, I was representing Sweden at the time, was on the Security Council. Uh, we pushed for a few issues and Germany was to succeed us on the Security Council in 2019. But already the day we joined, the German machinery started to <laughs> prepare itself for the term that would come only two years later, um, which, is, uh, which, is, which is impressive in itself. So in Stockholm, Berlin, in New York, there were delegations of German diplomats trying to find out um, you know, how you push for a certain agenda, even before we had pushed any agenda, honestly. <laughs> um, but the point here being that the attitude of Germany was to be super ambitious, but also in the listening mode, which is also different, to be honest, of if you compare to some of the other major powers in the UN who will also out reach out to you, but with a completely different agenda to try to influence you and try to you know, have you dance to their tune. So um, an A plus for your attitude and for your ambition as well. Um, a third reflection, uh, summing up a little bit what has been said today, I also want to pay tribute to your European instincts and how you have defended the values of the European Union on your, during your term on the Security Council. Your faith in diplomacy and peaceful resolution of conflicts, we've seen that, how you stood up for the Iran deal um, in the face of some pretty powerful opposition. Um, protection of uh, international law, international humanitarian law, the whole Syria border crossing um, effort, human rights, very, very strong. All of that, which is so strongly based, I think in the, again, the set of European values that we try to export in any way we can based on our own experience. And the way you, uh, Christophe and Nicola mentioned it before and, and your minister uh, Maas, how you, made sure that there was a European Union stakeout on every discussion in the Security Council to manifest the strong support for those values. So again, uh, A plus for your uh, defending the European values, maybe an A minus in terms of the results achieved, but that was not, <laughs> <laughs> that was not uh, your fault. That was the uh, geopolitical context that Karin Lindgren spoke about uh, before. <laughs> Finally, uh, the tribute to you, Christoph, and I think I speak on behalf of everyone here when I say that, um, you know, the fact that you've been part of 30 years of the most historic events in Germany, in Brussels, um, and beyond, uh, and you brought all that experience, all that mastery of the substance into your work here, leading a formidable team that the German mission here is, is uh, something that we all feel very privileged that we've been part of. Um, it's true that you sometimes been unscripted, uh, but I say that in the most uh, positive uh, definition of the word. No one can speak without a script unless you have the full mastery of the substance. But I think, think it's also a reflection of your personal passion and commitment to making sure that that substance is, is presented in a way which is to the point and, and comes from your soul and your heart. And that is really an amazing quality. Finally, um, you've been a strong promoter of diplomacy, not for diplomacy for the means of diplomacy, but for means to actually uh, improve the life of people around the world. 
So just to say, Christophe, it's been a privilege uh, working with you and to count you as a friend. And I think I speak on everybody's behalf when I say that. But before I close, uh, as we all know, behind every successful man, there is a brilliant woman. Um, and of course, to Ina too, um, a great uh, tribute uh, to, to you uh, for your fantastic contribution. And we're thankful. <laughs> <laughs> An A plus to Ina and of course uh, to Germany. Congratulations that you will not retire as your husband uh, does. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, what can I say? It's the last day. I can only say an A plus to the audience who was patient and who was here, even though there was the soccer game. Never mind. Thank you very much for all of that. We now really have to say goodbye to Christoph Hoiskin. And of course, we wish you all the best in the world for you, for your family, happiness, luck, and perseverance. As we learned, never give up. And I think from now on, Actually, tomorrow on, you can say whatever you please. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and uh, goodbye. Hope to see you again some other time. <laughs> <laughs>